All right, we're one minute into the to the presentation, so I think I'll get going. You guys can see my screen, and uh, we have the chat open for any comments and feedback, and we welcome anyone that has questions or I would like to get some answers at the end. So what I'll try to do in this presentation today is to compress it to 15, 20 minutes top so that we have plenty of time of uh, Q&A because I, uh, I implore everybody to think about some stuff and be candid and be as bold as you'd like to, to speak a little bit about your thoughts and uh, uh, things I wasn't clear on or something I could uh, clarify better during this presentation. So with further ado, um, uh, I really want to say thanks for joining today's session and giving me a chance to share uh, on Cargill's behalf of what we're doing and in our journey, in our, in our ambition to digitalize the food supply chain in leveraging Hyperledger Grid. It's a real unique uh, proposition that I get the privilege of leading in my role as digital product line leader. Um, my name is, by the way, Bora Mulnar, and guessing by my name, uh, I'm not based in the United States. I live, I live in the Netherlands, uh, but I'm based in uh, Cargill Schiphol. So we're in the Schiphol office, which is next to the uh, airport, which is the airport location. So if you're ever around, let me know. But I hope that post pandemic, we get to see a little bit of the globe again in person. So if we ever get a chance to meet in person, I also look forward to that opportunity. I hope you're all doing well and uh, excited to kick things off. So with that, um, talking a little bit about why Cargill set on this journey and something that I think also is close to a lot of our hearts uh, and something we've all experienced in different ways and meanings is uh, the, the change of what the pandemic has brought to, to many industries, including Cargill's, about the need to digitalize and invest in data. A couple of things that really stood out for us is that we we always knew we had to invest and we always knew there were elements of the supply chain that were predominantly out there that we needed to go after. But with the pandemic and forcing us to work away from the office and in our own safety of our homes, it really created a new urgency to create that transparency and visibility. So the thing I like about this quote from the New York Times is really that it's really compressing all the issues into an accelerated funnel and uh, accelerating the thought process and the leadership support that we need to start the, the journey for that digitalization. And I think it's it's really fitting for today's conversation to talk a little bit about what trends we've we've seen and how did those issues compress our need to invest in this technology and how is it benefiting us. So for those that are not familiar with Cargill, Cargill is a global agricultural business. Um, we were, we've been in existence over 150 years, uh, started in the United States with uh, corn milling and uh, training, and that's grown over the years organically and with acquisition in different product lines. We're active in animal nutrition and feed mix. Uh, we're also a bit, uh, active in uh, aqua nutrition and different product lines there. And we're also now specializing in health and optimized feed. And we're also very active in commodity trading, such as soybean, uh, soy meal, uh, we have palm oil, we have cocoa, and many other diverse product lines across the globe. A couple of trends that are predominant for a company such as Cargill in the food industry is to really think about the trends externally of how that transformation is driving the force in terms of the growth of the food ecosystem and what kind of products are on the shelf. The difficulty of those growing products on the shelf isn't per se uh, the number of products, but the complexity to manufacture and produce and distribute those products. And that's really where Cargill sits. And we also expect, and everybody's pretty informed, I guess, about this, is that the increase of demand will also grow with the growing population of the earth. At the core of that, with the growing ecosystem and increased demand, Cargill has a very important role to play in the safety of our food. We hold ourselves accountable to the industry standards, the regional standards, and our customer standards. And more and more, we're also seeing that there is a desire and need to certificate, certificate the proof of origin of, the, of the, the raw material to a semi-finished goods or to a finished good. And with that, we also have a, a significant role and an influence also in the sustainability and, and sourcing space, and predominantly uh, an important one to play in the area of risk management. Um, to give you kind of a flavor of this, a, a key topic that is very well on everybody's radar today is, is the topic of deforestation and farmer livelihood. And those are just two examples of risks that we are trying to manage in our supply chain by being proactive and preemptive to prevent these from happening and manage, making sure that our supply chains are, are credible for, for the raw materials and how we source them and what we source. And this is key for our, for our future growth and really closing the loop on, on, these, uh, on these trends. One of the things that is key and that we've seen as we looked externally with these trends is that we see that our partners are experiencing the same thing. And when we say partners from a cargo lens, we really mean our suppliers and our customers 
and potentially also down the road our customers customer and that is an an, an issue in the sense of how do we create that remove that friction and that we create the effective collaboration and it sounds very heavy but it really what it means is that that seamless value chain experience that we're all seeking to go after and a value chain in our view could really be that bean to bar that a seed to spoon and the farm to fork concept that we've heard a lot about and we are truly convinced that uh, using new technologies we can actually mitigate some of those gaps that we have today so thinking about the concepts of those value chains we all we see this notion of the journey from a farmer through a local trader and buying station all the way to manufacturer to maybe another manufacturer that then goes to transporter and all the way ends up to a consumer and to be clear this is illustrative don't hold me accountable here for for the accuracy of the supply chain but what is key here is that each of those roles that you see in these circles has a role to play a farmer for example cares deeply about fast liquidity if we purchase cocoa beans from a farmer we want to make sure that that person gets paid upfront as the transaction happens the farmer doesn't want to wait to pay for the payment to come in after it's been traded or processed through the supply chain another example is that a manufacturer wants a better forecast of the demand in the market from a retail perspective and a retailer might worry more from an angle do i have food recall issues for my consumers and how do i manage that risk in the supply chain and as you kind of unravel that you can imagine that those type of natures of problems exist across that network and as we think about the network and how it's set up today it's really in a different and a uniquely uh, structured way that each of those relationships have unique problems that they solve but they don't find that they're struggling to find the common ground so a thing we see from a technology side but also from a business process side that they're really tailored to a point-to-point -point solution not not that being a bad thing but it doesn't overcome and overarch the bigger picture. The other thing is that as we create those point-to-point -point relationships, they are driven by a definition of standard that they agree on, but are they really defined by an industry standard? In our experience, that's been real, a really tough animal to wrestle with, and we see that in a lot of examples in the work we do. And because of those standards and the point-to-point -point relationship, getting access to data becomes a key enabler. And we see a lot of investment in, in web portals and different capabilities that provide insight, but really having access to the transactional nature and having that reach deep into the supply chain and value chain is something that is still a big hurdle. And with all of that effort and all that energy and also the investments coming into the landscape, it's also about how do we create value from an efficiency piece and uh, um, cost management perspective because it, at the end of the day the, the true value for us is to mitigate the costs and the efficiencies that are really here so how are we thinking about this if we continue to look at this network and we're seeing at it from a different lens we're seeing the opportunity actually to say hey here is actually a landscape where we can think about efficiency transparency and security and how are we thinking about this so in the role of a manufacturer to a distributor or to a retailer, we said, what if we have a technology running in the background that is facilitating the, the elementary capability of a node to enable some basic distributed capabilities? As you then create the network, and it's now being visualized in a, in a blue state, you're actually transcending that point-to-point -point relationship and actually creating meaningful connections that allow you to think differently about how you create those, those, those bridges today. And as you can see, the illustration now is from a retailer to a manufacturer and from a manufacturer to a distributor, but it's also now crossing potential other steps in the supply chain. And what is interesting in that relationship now that because of the deployment of the standards and the technology, a retailer can also now think about a dotted line to a potentially new distributor that actually closes the loop and brings new value. And how this all works and looks, we'll talk about a little bit more meaningfully in, ex in an example I have lined up. But this is really to illustrate graphically and from a helicopter view how we are thinking of how this connection should be established. The reasons what this brings ultimately anyone that participates is really this notion of transparency. Ultimately, people that have uh, companies that deploy these capabilities are, are going to be positioned to make better and faster decisions, and they are going to have a better overview of ongoing processes. And to be clear, the information that they have, they can also share it externally, but that will be obviously with different capabilities than with uh, technologies such as Hyperledger Grid. The important piece is coming back to some of the, uh, the trends and also the, uh, the sustainability and the issues we we're talking about. Traceability is a, is a word that is being used a lot in our supply chain today. And what it really means is, is a difficult word to grasp, but from a data angle, 
it's really about connecting the physical with the digital to verify authenticity and verify the actual actuality of the transaction, for example. And allowing others to see what's happened and verify that state is ultimately the foundation of how we see we can improve trust amongst others. And if you combine transparency and traceability as two capabilities across this network, you can really enable other meaningful initiatives in the sustainability space. So for us, these are really key enablers in that. But we are obviously here today from a from a hyperledger perspective, and I really want to position this also from a perspective that technology is a true enabler. And one of Cargill's beliefs in this in this journey is that anyone in the industry should have access to the technology and should have access to uh, enable and um, invest in the technology in a similar way. We believe that there are phenomenal uh, software vendors out there that do great and amazing things. And our view is here that there's actually an opportunity to, to position this open source and build this collectively with the industry and our partners out there and make it available to anyone that wants to participate, which is already the case today. Ultimately, this lowers the threshold and the barrier to entry. And I think that makes a huge difference of how we see the value come to, to life. Ultimately, we talked about the efficiency piece and the cost of investment. The more this gets integrated and the more this gets adopted throughout time, the, the more automation you will find in, in this network and in the supply chains. That will actually remove all that friction that we talked about, and that's obviously some of the big benefit that it brings to the table. Ultimately, and this is also an important piece to call out, um, we are seeing that leveraging Hyperledger Grid as, a, as an application layer on, on, the, on the distributed ledger capability is also another software that we purposely invested in that allows us to privatize and secure those relationships. Again, in the diagram, we're talking about that relationship between the manufacturer and the distributor. That relationship is private for all the right reasons. Maybe they have price agreements, maybe they have specific items that are only manufactured for that specific distributor. Those relationships need to be private and we secure that in a meaningful and thoughtful way. And I'll obviously I'm happy to speak more about that in uh, in the following slides. And I think that is an important piece to call out because with a lot of distributed ledger technologies and open source capability or general technology capabilities in this nature is one of the things that we've seen that uh, sharing data is, is proprietary and important, but maybe not always for certain relationships. So that's something we thought of as well. So how are we seeing the bigger picture of, the, of what we're wanting to do with Hyperledger Grid? So what is our future vision and what are our current priorities? So a little bit giving you a flavor of the screen you're looking at right now is a stack of ideas of business apps that we are going to go after in between now and the foreseeable future. To be clear, this is not set in stone. This is a proprietary map that we have highlighted for capabilities that we want to invest in. So, um, and as you can see by, by glancing on a few of them on, on the top part of the uh, uh, dotted lines is ideas of apps that are meaningful to our customers and suppliers. How this really works is that we are building and developing and uh, designing grid components, and those are highlighted in the lower box in the yellow dotted line that we are uh, marking with the little cogwheels in the, in the white uh, squares. So to give you an example, we are developing grid products. We'll have a demo lined up a little bit shortly. We are investing in location, which is another component. So how you should look at Hyperledger Grid in, in our view of the, of the capability is really building individual components that stack up like, like Lego blocks. And as you combine them, they add up to a capability or application. To give you an example, um, we've been investing a significant amount of time enabling transactional capabilities on, on the Hyperledger Grid software platform. And so we've taken Grid purchase order here as an example which is really about a default workflow that needs permissions, roles to basically execute purchase orders of raw materials between a supplier, a processor, and a manufacturer. In this regard, we needed four additional capabilities or components that needed to funnel up like Lego blocks to build that grid purchase order view. So grid identity is the key component that is needed to, to facilitate the role-based nature. Grid product, which is something we'll demo separately, is also a unique component that can run individually. But if you group it with these other four, you can actually create an additional value added app. The workflow component manages the process flow 
and location is necessary because once we go outside the company walls, we need to manage purchase order across potentially uh, country borders and obviously different locations around the globe. All of these things packed up, like I said, Lego stacks build up the application. So where are we then from a perspective in our journey? And here's kind of the, the framework that has dismantled the last two slides and kind of a roadmap for the vision going forward. And one of, one of the things is key is that, again, this gives you a flavor of how we are looking at the journey. And we're really investing today in key and core capabilities that are necessary for, for Grid uh, to be mature and scalable to the next series of features that we have lined up. We see phase two really about further automation and then really down the road, the, the value creation. To be very candid, we see we kind of have rough estimations of timing here, but it's rough and guesstimate at best. I think the journey could be inev inevitably long with a good context here because you can continuously develop on the software stack to add capabilities that are important to you. And to call another thing out, these are the things we are targeting. That doesn't mean we won't deviate. We will, and we have already in the past. And we've also seen that there are other capabilities potentially out there that people want to go after, and I encourage people to do so. So one thing I'll touch on quickly, and I know we're, we're, go, we're, we're flying through this, is why would a company then invest in capabilities and how do we create that efficiency and how does a CFO or how does our CIO or a CEO say this makes a ton of sense to me because ultimately you're really talking to the, these guys about blockchain ultimately in one form or capacity and you're trying to tell them, hey, we need to invest in this because this makes a ton of sense. But that's like describing to them, you know, we're trying to invent the internet before the internet was invented. So how do we measure value and how do we capture it? For Cargill, it is really about removing that friction. And we've looked at it from two beneficial angles in two examples of two customer types. So the dollars you're seeing here are illustrative, but we have done some math and they're very conservative, but they give you kind of a flavor of what you can think about of how Cargill is seeing the value from a mutual beneficial side. So take an example here. If we had a better on, uh, perspective of disputes and managing and lowering those between 10 to 35% between a retail customer or a distribution customer, you could think about anywhere on a year-on-year -year basis efficiency gain of 300 to 260 k benefits. Now, what does that mean? This is basically a time material expression. So in other words, dollars times hours spent on actually managing these type of efficiency pieces in our business. Why is this important? This is not a reason, obviously, to, to look at the workforce, but it's more how do we deploy the workforce effectively and meaningfully? And if you think about this, the, the beneficial side, a distributor has 1,000 to 10,000 relationships that they have as suppliers to them, including Cargill, and the more this gets adopted and the more widely spread this is saturated into the industry, the more the mutual benefit grows for everyone participating. So this is really an interesting lens to look at a grassroots perspective of what kind of processes do we have? How can we overcome those friction in the processes and how can technology enable that? This is the result of it and giving you a glance and a flavor of how this works. The key aspect that I wanna call out, maybe some people see this as a low number, some see it as high, but the key underlining tone is also that this is not a working capital lens that is exempt from this story. So this is truly the efficiency piece only. So the overall PL and work balance benefit is actually even higher for certain companies. So that's really something to, to think about. But now I really want to make it just tangible for you guys because you've been listening to me about talking about the vision and how we're investing and how we're investing in hyperledger grid. But I just want to show you guys an example. So remember the purchase order piece that I call that a specific component. Well, I'm going to demonstrate it shortly, a little video and showcase a UI component on top of it of how grid product works. So a couple of things are, and now we're really coming down to a level of an individual component, but that can actually operate individually on the stack. So uh, the efficiency pieces are really predominantly important, but this is a real milestone and we've been working actively with a series of customers deploying this technology as we speak. And the beauty of this is, is that we are now getting into a state where we are actively sharing product information in a shared state across a distributed capability. And that is a really important milestone um, for a couple of reasons, because it means that new technology is finding its way integrated on both sides of a trading party. Um, but it also brings a ton of value in, in a lot of different ways. And we've created a UI that you're looking at 
that just gives you the experience of how does this, how does this look and feel. I'm going to switch to the next slide and I'll start a short video and there should be voiceover. And from that, you hopefully get a better taste of how the UI interacts and how it uh, how it moves and looks and feels. And again, it's early prototyping work from uh, a couple of months ago. The, today's state is a little bit more modern, but that's why we captured it. Hi, I'm Darian Plum. I'm a software engineer working on distributed ledger systems and a maintainer of Hyper Hyperledger Grid. In this video, I'll go over the value statement for Grid product, take a quick look at its design, and show an example of how it can be used. Grid product is a feature within the Hyperledger Grid platform. It provides a way to share standardized product data for items that are transacted, traded, or referenced in a supply chain. Grid product is grounded in GDSN standards, which are widely adopted open standards developed and maintained by GS1 to represent product data. However, Grid product features a flexible design that can be extended to other standards as well. With Grid product, we can ensure that any product data we choose to share with our trading partners will be up to date and have the correct taxonomy. But how does Grid product accomplish this? There are three main components that make up the Grid product infrastructure. Templates. Any data that goes through Grid product has to adhere to a defined template. Grid product includes a default template that implements GS1 standards, but it's possible to define templates based on other standards to meet the needs of the parties involved. Rules. In a distributed ledger, smart contracts encode the logic of the system. They ensure the validity of any new data that is shared through Grid. In the case of product, the smart contract ensures that the product data actually adheres to the template that we defined earlier. Permissions. Grid product integrates seamlessly with the grid permissions capability. This capability allows an administrator to grant certain agents the permission to write data to the distributed ledger. This ensures that only agents with the proper roles have the ability to create, update, or delete product records on grid product. Now we'll show an example of how grid product can be used. As you can see, we don't currently have any products shared through Grid, so let's create one. First, we enter the GS1 identifier for the product that we'd like to share. Next, we select the trading partner relationship where we'd like to share this data. And finally, we enter in our Grid organization ID. Next, we need to create the product record. There are a few different options here. We can enter the data manually, or we can drag and drop a spreadsheet which contains our product data. Grid product also has the ability to integrate with existing data management solutions via the Grid REST API. This would allow us to add many product records at once. For large data sets, this would be preferable over using this UI experience. Finally, we review the record and submit the transaction. This will be validated by each trading partner's Grid node. If all partners are in consensus that this data is valid based on the defined template, and smart contracts, this data will be added to our shared state. As you can see, we've now created a product record using grid product. This data is replicated on all nodes in the trading partner relationship. If for some reason the product record has to be updated, we can use the grid UI to make those changes as well. Thanks for watching this video going over the basics of grid. Awesome. I hope that video with the voiceover was clear and understandable. I, I'm happy to share this, obviously, if you want to see it again. The flavor, I think what is key here is that the capabilities that we're going after have always been focused from a business perspective backwards, but obviously it's open source and available to anyone to go after problems that are meaningful and important to them. The, the pieces that I think is key of just a demonstration like Grid product with the UI layer that it gives some tangibility uh, for other people to see of how this technology actually enables all of that value. Having said that, I've been speaking a little bit longer than I planned for, so I hope this was valuable. I hope you guys had a little bit of line of sight of what Cargill's doing and why we're investing in these technologies. I welcome anyone to join the conversation today. I'm going to switch back to the window in a minute for Q&A because I want to make sure that we cover all the questions that we have. And I encourage anyone to join the conversation and participate. The hyperlinks here are all active, so I uh, I encourage you. And I also drop my email address for anyone that wants to follow up offline or in a, in a direct uh, direct level. 
With that, I'm going to switch back to the Q&A side. So, so let's have a look here. So we have a question for the UI. Is a great visualization, but does this create a separate meta, meta, meta manual data entry? So a good question from someone here in the audience. So the UI is a temporary means to insert data indeed to the, to the capability. Ultimately, what you really want to do is automate this. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. We're building a capability known as Griddle that is using today um, XML insertion. And what we're really uh, in the process of also building in the foundation is the integrating component to extract data from source systems. And you can imagine source systems like SAP, Oracle, or other master data systems that you have in your company environment or professional environment that you want to integrate. And this is really where my teams are working with our global IT organization on the cargo side. And we're doing the same and coaching our customers and partners to do the same with their IT side to integrate. And that's when it gets seamless. And then it, it comes back to that initial picture where you saw all the, the, the meat patties uh, lined up because then you have a fully fledged and automated integrated system. Um, so I hope this answers, answers some of that, some of the question. Um, uh, someone else, Bern is also asking a question. Hey, Bern, thanks for joining today. Um, there's a lot of a lot of detail about business process here. Normal companies would not share this level of detail publicly. Why is Kaggle? Yeah, it's a really good question, Bern. So a thing that we purposefully see and do is that the friction that we experience, like I said, other companies experience as well. We've worked in consortia uh, with four other trading parties that I can transparently say they are equal or small or close to the size of cargo themselves in different roles to play, such as distributors, manufacturers, and retailers. And in that space, um, these type of frictions matter because it impacts their bottom line and top line every day. And I think we've learned by being transparent and we, uh, by calling out the frictions and inefficiencies we have that we can see the collective opportunity. We also do this to say, it's not about making money because nothing about uh, the notion of value is about a revenue. It's about removing that friction and actually creating meaningful relationships that actually create more stickiness and allow to spend time as co corporations and companies in the areas to, to remedy the trends that I highlighted earlier. So for us, the transparency not only comes with the tech, the software, but also about the value generation. And it should be a, a mutual benefit because otherwise I don't think anybody else would like to adopt it. Um, we have Arnab also asking a question. Um, uh, what about small partners who can't afford a note? Well, I think this is also a very interesting question. So from the other technology stack, and I purposefully didn't address this today, and it's obviously a hyperledger forum debate. Um, I want to ensure that we also made the software available from a from a note perspective open source, which is in this case leverage from Splinter side. And we encourage anyone to go out there. Obviously, to set up a node, you will have to run a VM and you can you will need to, to pull your in a basic setting a credit card and go to Azure or Amazon Web Services and set up a virtual machine to start installing the node. But that's really all the, the all it takes. At the end of the day, a credit card with uh, um, and setting up a VM is ultimately your limited threshold to, to barrier to entry. Um, thanks, Arna. Um, a question from Shane: How is the separation between private and public data in the system? What's the shared ledger and what's private between peers? Yeah, this is really a good question. So the separation between private and share and public data is really managed through the splinter infrastructure so splinter runs as a capability between a party a and a party b and creating a closed circuit that allows therefore on that circuit to for software to be deployed and in this case we're deploying hyperledger grid capabilities on top of that circuit that circuit in any state can be extended to multiple parties or you can set up a, a separate node with a different party and create a separate circuit to that relationship. So in other words, that is private. And if you want to make things public, you can create a role-based capability on top of grid that allows others to participate and verify transactions or verification of data. We haven't per se seen a use case yet, but we have some really cool ideas in the sustainability space on, uh, on grievances in the supply chain on how we are thinking about that stuff. So I hope that gives you kind of a, a lens in uh, in how we are uh, exchanging that. Shane, is there any uh, shared ledger? I'm not familiar with Splinter. I encourage you, Shane, to, to visit splinter.dev and have a look. We have a game room set up. You can also download the demo there and have a look on how this capability really sets up and how it functions. 
Um, and no means I might try to wrestle down the question, but it's uh, it's a more complex story than just to try the functionality of a new stack. Mark, thanks for your question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the data privacy? Um, yeah, that comes close to my last answer. The data privacy is really key here, right? If, if Cargill as a manufacturer, for example, has a relationship with the distributor that we have a certain price relationship for an item, the distributor might not want his, his or her competition to know that price agreement that they've made with Cargill. The important piece is that the way you set up those circuits and the way you deploy the capabilities actually pre prevents that information from being exposed anywhere else. And there are different grid capabilities that you need to build to solve for that. So an example could be if it's about an item, uh, let's take a beef patty uh, uh, sized uh, 300 uh, pounds. And um, we've agreed that that costs $2 per pound, right? Then that needs to be extended through grid catalog, which is something we're exploring in our second phase. And that will then be a privatized data attribute that will be part of the uh, original item setup and classification. So I hope that kind of gives you an understanding of how we would then implement some of that. And that is then adhered through the distributed ledger and also the, the grid capability. Um, last uh, question I think I have on the ledger here. Um, you heard many announcements about food traceability initiatives. How do these come together or do they not need to? That's a really good question. So if you look at the sourcing and origination side of, of this industry, it's a predominantly different uh, game to play because the reach is much more uh, diverse than, than you would like to think. We always think that there's a bulk of only a handful of farmers that produce the masses of the world. But if you think about palm oil and cocoa alone, there are hundreds and thousands, if not millions of small hole farmers that do all this work. And the reach back into that left side of that journey is, is really a challenge. And the corporation like Cargill has a, a significant role to play to reach, but we're not the only ones participating. It's other corporations, it's governments, it's other uh, bodies, NGOs as well. So it's really about the co-creation of capabilities and that transparency. One of the things that companies like Cargill have been doing adamantly is provide sustainability reports to showcase and verify the improvements we're making from a sustainability lens in our sourcing piece. Capabilities like Grid can actually enable a lot more meaningful and truthful insight that allow real-time verification and access to all of the transactions that go on. What if you can connect a buying station as a transaction happens with a cocoa bag and you can tag it with a, with a barcode as it gets shipped with a truck across the country or region, then you can start thinking about tracking and tracing. But an NGO could come in and actually look at that data thinking about, hey, that's now a sustainably sourced piece because it came from farmer X who's been certified as a sustainable farmer, for example, from a fair trade perspective or from an OOTS. So these are just two examples, of course, from certification bodies, but these are just the concepts that we are thinking about. Um, and yes, last question, and then I know we're ready over time, five minutes. Will there be a version of these slides available? Yes, absolutely. I will upload these slides. Uh, I haven't done so because they were too big, but I'll find time tonight to, uh, to load them into this speaker setup. And then I think you guys should have access to it. So I'll both load up the uh, a, a PowerPoint version and a, a PDF, and then you should be able to also use the links and review some of the content today. Let me just browse through the last question if I missed anything. Oh, sorry, Bern, I missed something as well from you. Um, blah, 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 partners, you mentioned privacy companies earlier. Yeah, I think I covered that one. So the, the privacy piece for, for company and, and blockchain. So I hope that is uh, that's well addressed. With that, guys, um, I'm well over five minutes already of my time. and. I really appreciate people's questions and answers. Again, my information uh, contact details are here. I encourage folks to, to try out the hyperlinks, to play a little bit around with that, the Splinter demo, but more importantly, uh, get active. You can reach us on the, the Hyperledger um, uh, chat, which is in the chat uh, hyperlink on the right. Uh, the, the development team is active there daily, and we have deployed all the software in our GitHub repository. So visit the, the second link of the middle box, because there you have access to the repo and I encourage anyone that has interest or wants to explore further to get active on the community and, and of course, participate. That would be fantastic as well. So with that, I really want to say thank you. And it's been a privilege here to speak. Uh, there's always a ton to talk about. And I'm you can tell by my tone of voice, I'm really hyped and excited about this space. And, I'm, and I think this is the right journey forward for, for us and for others to, uh, to play in this space. 
So with that, I would like to say thank you so much also to the Hyperledger uh, people for arranging this and setting this up because it's really well executed and I really appreciate uh, the momentum and anyone in the audience today for taking the time and listening to our story. Thank you and have a good day, a good evening and good night.